Hello, and welcome to the Celebration Church Podcast. We are a faith-filled, family-focused church located in Lakeville, Minnesota. In a moment, you will hear a sermon from one of our pastors. We hope that you enjoy and grow closer to God through these messages. And now, for a message from our lead pastor, Derek Ross. All right, well, good morning. morning. Little uh, voice update, it's the same, still messed up, so uh, deal with it, because I am, and uh, we'll just get along with it. All right, Uh, my name is Derek, and I'm the lead pastor at Celebration, and it is getting worse throughout the day, by the way, so I don't know, if you need to watch the first service recording, you can do so. Welcome to those watching and worshiping online. Uh, We're continuing, uh, concluding our series on prayer, not concluding praying, just the sermon series on praying, right? And we've been focused this time, try to increase our knowledge and understanding of prayer. It's so much more than just a crisis prayer when we're in need of help, but it includes that. It's more than praying for our food, which is interesting if we're at a fast food place. You know, whatever those uh, things are, uh, I believe we're called to live lives of prayer, regardless of the alphabetical format of those points, but uh, hopefully that blessed you last week. Pastor Dan complained to me this week because the 10th point was an S and it was not a J. But I didn't know what else to say for spirit. So we just stuck with it. And I said, there's a lot more letters. You know, like I said, L was missing, lament. That's also a prayer. You could do that after the Vikings lose twice in five days. Whatever you feel like you need to do. Listen, don't get offended yet. Your opportunity is coming. Okay. (laughs) All right. Ephesians chapter six and verse 18. I know I'm going to talk a little bit about some politics. This week I told Pastor Vicente, uh, I actually have, part of me wants to show up today and say, I ain't saying nothing and see how many people got mad and left just to reveal your political idolatry. But Vicente told me I better not because I don't want to learn that lesson. Okay. Anyway, Ephesians chapter six. Come on, we're going to read it together. If you're able, if you'd stand, uh, let's read it out loud. If you're new with us, even if you're shy or timid, uh, we're going to try to whisper it or something, you know, and uh, we're going to say this verse together. There's something that happens uh, with the spirit of unity, I think, when the word of God is read together. And there'll be other passages of scripture that I get to that uh, I'll just do the reading and you can do the listening. But this is our theme verse for this month. It's Ephesians chapter six and verse 18. I think. It was there last service. There it is. I, I could have quoted it, but I'm you people. <laughs> All right, come on, let's read together. And pray in the spirit... This in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's what we're talking about today. You see that title on your note sheet. Pray for all the Lord's people, which includes the people that vote the way you want them to and the ones that don't. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who's revealed to us. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Help nobody leave the same, but everybody more like you, Lord Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 You may be seated and get to that note sheet. My daughter wants me to get there quicker than I did in the first service. We ran out of time. My goal is that after I share this and then uh, teach on different gifts of the spirit that we'll have a few minutes together to pray in those small groups like we've been doing and uh, ask the Lord to speak to us because they are good gifts for his children. Um, I'd like to remind you of a few things, lay a few groundwork uh, rules before I, I, I just talk a little bit about politics. I find it in the, in the verse, but um, number one, I really mean this, that I am doing my best to hear from God to lead this church. I don't know if I'm perfect, doubt it, but uh, you don't have to take a survey on that, thanks. But I am doing my best. And so keep praying for your pastor. Um, number two, Later today or any day, when you begin to question that, refer back to number one. (laughs) 
little bit lighter mood in the room today. Did some of you guys watch first service online? I don't know. So it was dicey in the first service there. You'd have think I was talking about giving money to missions or something. So that's next week. Okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> this is what the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, right? We were just uh, earlier in the year, but Ephesians chapter six, talking about the armor of God. Make sure you put it all on. Don't be a spiritual streaker. Now you're going to deal with that mental picture when I talk about politics. He said, with that in mind, be alert. So gonna, that word alert means to watch, be aware of, be on guard. I would say pay attention. Now I know uh, as my father this morning is preaching at a Ukrainian church, they may be slightly con- or concerned about something slightly different than many in the room here. So we, ought to, we all have a different uh, varying degree of what we need to pay attention to or what's closest to us. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, there was no America election 2024 when the letter was written. Nor was there a war in Ukraine or lack of a southern border. Pick the topic that you and I are aware of today. It wasn't there back then. But what was the context of what Paul was saying? Pay attention to the spiritual warfare that's going on around you. By the way, um, I I talked through my message most Sunday mornings with Pastor Lewis, and he told me that his estimation is 98% of people will not like what I have to say today. I was like, even Jesus didn't get everybody. He lost Judas. Okay, so that's a different math the other way. Okay. But pay attention to what's going on. I would say, especially in these times where we're being told that our neighbor is our enemy and not the spiritual forces of evil that are active in the heavenly realms. Even in the middle of those of us that are American citizens being faced with an opportunity to participate in our governmental structure We've got to be alert or pay attention to what's really going on. So when we vote, I think it's interesting. I posted yesterday that I voted and that we've lived here in Minnesota for over nine years. And it seems like our state has kind of continued to depart from traditional biblical values. And um, it's interesting to me. I'm not surprised why people are surprised that I'm pretty conservative, like I'm an AG ordained minister. Um, That's just the deal. Our our denomination, our fellowship still holds to one man and one woman for life is God's best plan in marriage. Uh, Our ministers, myself included, uh, signed to agree that we won't partake in alcohol or other addictive substances, not because they're a sin, but just because of a wisdom issue of leading uh, a call above. So I don't know why anybody's like surprised if I use the word conservative, but yesterday you would think I lit a bomb off on social media. Now, I would have thought that posting that Jesus is the only way would be a controversial topic, but people will scroll right by. But I say I voted conservatively and all of a sudden all people want to do is talk about Trump. They love him or they hate him. I didn't do the math yesterday when I voted, but it had to be like 30, 36 different things that I had opportunity to vote for. One of which was outside the state of Minnesota. So I think it's interesting mathematically when people only want to talk about 3% of a voting option and omit the other 97%. So uh, let me just continue offending everybody. Voting is just the entry point not the full extent of our involvement in the society in which we live. I mentioned before, we're not going to demonize and say, if you don't vote for, you can't go to heaven. I mentioned earlier the absurdity of those kind of comments. That means no one under the age of 18 can go to heaven. I mean, I know not a lot of them between 13 and 18 are gonna go anyway, but I'm just saying. Oh, hey guys, okay. (laughs) My sister-in-law, lived in our great nation for a number of years with a green card from Germany. She wasn't able to vote. Thankfully, Jesus hasn't come back. Now she's a citizen and she can go to heaven. 
So we're just going to stop short of those kind of comments that aren't helping anyway, and they're not factually true. So when it comes to voting and politics, people are like, Pastor, I got a lot of emails this week about it. Some of you are very excited for these moments. You'd probably be less excited when I'm done, but uh, most people, when they email me a long list of like videos and their thoughts, they're not looking for me to convince them or that they're unsure. They're looking for me to convince others of their already point of view. And uh, I don't tend to watch a lot of those videos because I have a lot of things going on. But here's, I believe, and I personally uh, participate in voting because I pay my taxes and it's an opportunity to do so, but I'm not super passionate about it. If you want to be passionate about it, that's awesome. Uh, either way, you know, but it's pro- I'm probably not you, but, um, but I think we ought to participate because people get elected whether we participate or not. If you have a conscientious objection to one of those 36 places on the ballot, fine. But to say, I'm just, I'm in this world, but not of it. It's like, oh, that's not really what the verse is talking about. Like you have opportunity. And I'm just saying like, they're going to get elected either way. So don't not vote to send a message because they're not going to read it. Right? Have a conversation with them that says these things and whatever. Okay. So uh, I would agree. I've seen some things. People sent me some messages at other people online. And a lot of times talking about politics feels like Saul's armor to me as David. Like, it's just not, I don't enjoy reading about it, whatever that kind of stuff. But I do agree that our vote is not a Valentine, right? It doesn't mean you have to want to date this person. Will you be mine? You're sending a vote. But I would also like to remind everybody, your vote is not a Valentine. You ain't going to marry that candidate. Some of you think you are, I think. You know, you're just online, you're like, ooh, a lovey-dovey. So they're, ha- they're married, okay? We don't know for how long, but they're currently married. That's funny, okay? That, that, was, that was funny, okay? I'm just, if you're offended, that was your choice because that was funny. It wasn't in my notes, but vote's not a Valentine. Settle down. Vote, but they're not gonna be your best friend. There's, they're mostly here locally. One of the concerns I have when we say, well, I don't really like any of the candidates. I mean, we'll join the club, but we need to become the candidates then. Right? I think it's cheap to sit on the sidelines and just complain if we don't get involved a little bit. Vote is the salt of the earth, right? Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. Salt was mostly to preserve what's left till Jesus comes back. I get that logic. Sadly, I don't think many Christians are trying to preserve what's left till Jesus comes back. I think Christians are just salty. I do. Right now, it's cool in some liberal circles to talk about separation of church and state. Pastors can't say that. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. But for people within my room, I'd love to see the separation of church and hate. I just don't understand why we have to hate each other. News, newsflash, we don't actually have to. Uh, we'll get the chance to pray together. So I think although voting and politics can be such a dividing topic, I love that in a moment I'll get to talk about gifts of the Spirit that are meant to unite us, to bring us together. And one of my encouragements, exhortations for you is don't forfeit here on the be alert political side what God wants to do there in the gifts of the spirit side. Voting is just an entry point, but not the full extent of our involvement in the society in which we live. I was baffled by Christians like, well, God's in control, nothing we can do. Queen Esther didn't take that approach. And I'm thankful for that when she learned of a plan to for the eradication of her people, the Jewish people, she got involved. She did something. I don't know what your did something is, but I hope you don't think voting is all it is. It's like an entry point. It begins there, but ought to go further. People talk about separation of church and state. It was actually more about keeping the state out of the church than the church out of the state, but we have bought into so many lies and distortions from the enemy. Along with that line, though, the Johnson Amendment, talking about the pastors can't utilize, uh, you know, their pulpit to sway an election, endorse a candidate, that kind of stuff. All that stuff's fine. To the best of my knowledge, you've never heard 
uh, an endorsement of a candidate or pushing of a party from this pulpit or even from my personal page. I do talk about conservative values. I've preached messages on things that are in the Bible because I think those matter. Now, because uh, I feel like I try to be a wise leader, I've done it before. It's an election cycle. So if you wonder what I think about uh, the Bible says what I think about what the Bible has to say about some real sensitive topics that I think still matter today. You can go back to October, 2021. The series was called, We Need to Talk. In that series, I preached an entire message on pornography. Against it, not for it, for those that weren't sure. I think that matters. And I don't think one vote 10 days from now is gonna change the pornographic addiction in our land. In fact, I printed off some stuff. This week, I saw an article, a survey, study, that finds more than half of Christians use pornography and they're comfortable with it. So to think checking a box is gonna fix all the problems in our land is naive at best and foolish at worst. I'm not even that concerned, although I'm not for, the widespread use of pornography in our land. But I'm deeply concerned, and I think we see effects in our society of sex without consequence. So another study, somebody sent it to me that says 104, 104 million people of faith are unlikely to vote in the upcoming election. So talk about voting. NFL players talking about voting. Everybody talking about voting. Unless you're not gonna vote like me, then don't vote. But I was a joke, by the way. I wasn't influencing a candidate. I was just saying that's what everybody thinks. 32 million self-identified Christians who regularly attend church won't cast their ballots. I think it's interesting. As I said, people get elected either way. I actually read the study a little bit more and I was actually more disturbed by something else. Not that 32 million church-going Christians won't vote. But it was over half of people who claim to be Christians don't go to any church. We've detached this faith from community, which means we really haven't read much of scripture. This isn't a, a, a doom and gloom, shame on you with your church attendance record. I'm just saying, if you have no community, you're not living in the context of community with anybody else, you've missed it. And so, well, although this article was sent to me to say, see, Christians don't vote. I read, see, people who think they're saved probably aren't. And my vote in a ballot box probably won't save them. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be involved. I'm just saying I read statistics and studies a little bit differently than maybe some people had hoped for. So I did a whole sermon on abortion, uh, pornography, then on abortion. So I think pornography leads to abortion. Why? Because it's the natural next step of sex without consequence. I grew up in diverse churches, churches where elected political leaders from both parties, Democrat and Republican, were present, members of the church. So I'm pretty familiar with that type of living. Um, but one thing that I felt like believers always agreed on was that life matters to God, that, that we ought to be pro-life. You might want to argue anti-abortion. I'm fine with any of those titles, actually, but that life in the womb, out of the womb, matters to God. And then Roe v. Wade got overturned and some people left our church because they said they didn't like that. Wow. And I thought, I think they missed the sermon. But I, I, anyway, I preached on abortion right after pornography. There's help and healing for those and we want to help. Okay, there, there's a sermon. If you're wondering what kind of stuff matters. Then another Sunday after that, I preached on gender confusion, identity, these things are in scripture. This isn't tied to one candidate. In fact, as I've looked throughout history, there was a time where people in both parties might have agreed on definition of marriage and then things change or there might have been agreement or on the need, but maybe a disagreement on how we're gonna get there. So that's why you probably won't find myself surrendering the pulpit to a different platform. But the issues, the concerns of God still stand 
true. So you can go back, you can watch all those sermons. You ought to be informed. Some of you are like, well, what Bible verse can you give us to encourage us in these days? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 15. We're in the book of Ephesians. If you flip back one chapter, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. What does he say? Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. There's your verse. <laughs> You're like, oh, I don't like that candidate. Oh, let me just blow your mind. I told my wife this, she got a little mad at me that I did it, but it's gonna make for an awesome story in my sermon. <laughs> Just because I like being a little bit contrarian. I know some of you would never guess that about your pastor, but sometimes I like to be contrarian. And because I've seen sermons online that uh, are veiled or slightly not so veiled attempts at saying you've gotta vote you know, Trump or other ones that say you definitely can't and you really have to vote Democrat or Actually, most of them are either for Trump or against Trump. That's not really Republican, Democrat anymore, but that's a whole separate deal. But I've seen a lot of, like I said, the mental gymnastics that some pastors have gone through to make Bible verses fit their political desires is interesting to me. But just to mess them all up, because I've heard people say like, Jesus isn't on the ballot. He was on mine yesterday. There was 36 spots on at least one, Jesus Christ got written in. I won't tell you which one, because then you're wondering, but I'm just saying. And guess what? I'm still gonna go to heaven. I am. I did write in of actual people with candidating. I, I voted for some that had been in a spot before. I voted people that were not in before. I voted for some people, and I even voted against some people. And I'm still gonna go to heaven. I'll see some of you there. <laughs> Who? Anyway, okay. Maybe you're like, man, it's just, it seemed. So, immediate, I hope you vote. Amen. If you're like, I just can't, I mean, I think you probably can. There's 36 spots, figure it out. But that's just like one small thing. Don't at all check a box and then be like, I'm done, now Jesus can come back. That's just like one immediate short thing. The next thing that I would probably say is, would you get involved, like locally, talk to a candidate and let them know, regardless if you voted for them or not, regardless uh, you know, if they candidated on a thing, and let them know, this is what I value. Here's some issues that matter in our schools, in our communities. Let's, let's make our voice heard because if regular Christians won't let their voice be heard, it's just the crazies that are doing all the talking. And number three, this is more like a long-term play. I'm praying for a return of Bible-believing, church-going, conservative-value Christians to encourage kids and grandkids to pursue a political office. Because again, it's cheap to say, I don't like anybody on this one, but what are we gonna do for four years from now and 20 years from now? At some point, I was talking with somebody, they were, they were reading their local uh, school board stuff and they're like, I don't see any conservative candidates in there. I said, well, then let's pray that somebody will stand up like Esther and say, I guess maybe it's my time. Because I get, you might not like an option that's there. So how can we fix it long-term going forward, not just sitting back and saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, I pray that more now than I ever have. Let's be involved. Let me see if any, I have anything else on my notes to make anybody else mad. Oh yeah, let's just make sure that we're not sitting back and doing nothing like Hezekiah. Sitting back and say, well, at least there's peace and security in my lifetime. I believe we all ought to make our voice heard, make our actions matter for our kids, for our grandkids, for those that are coming. We need to be involved. So for sure, we should avoid political idolatry, but also we must avoid political passivity and get in. Why? Because our allegiance to Christ no matter what a YouTube preacher has told you, our allegiance to Christ is not on the ballot this week. 
even if you voted for him, he's not gonna accept that four-year political office, <laughs> right? He's king of kings, he's lord of lords, he's on the throne. Yep. Having said that, I do think the future health of our nation is probably being discussed. And as long as you're gonna live here, why not be involved in it to make it the best we can? And I remind you, if tens of million of evangelical believers sit this one out, just like last time, a president will still be elected. A mayor in your town will still get elected. A school board seat will still be elected, whether you fold your hands and do nothing or you participate. So why not get involved if you can? In Minnesota, we make it very easy. Get involved. Lewis, don't laugh at me when I'm talking about this stuff. I'll remind you that elections are important. Even though I said I participate and I'm not super passionate about it, elections are important. But only the gospel is essential. So next week when we gather back, we're gonna be talking all month about missions, going across the street and around the world, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to people who can't vote in our election. They might live in a country where their election is totally rigged, whatever it is, but let's participate. Most of all, let's be alert, aware that it's not the commercial, it's not the neighbor. There is other spiritual forces in play, amen? All right, so what does he go on to say? Now what I really wanna preach on, you can see. Oh, thanks, Jeff, appreciate it. All right, only one person likes me. That's okay, I appreciate Jeff too. <laughs> By the way, one bonus of voting early is now I don't get any more political commercials. It's a cool feature. Just kidding, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> so you're like, really? Okay, no, all right. Here's what I wanna talk about, because I wanna talk about living Pentecostally, not just attending a Pentecostal church participating within the body of Christ. It was actually Dr. Carolyn Tennant's teachings uh, in April at our Minnesota District uh, Equip Conference. She was teaching on the combination of the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and how we need them together. We don't need any more people uh, being utilized in the gift of the Spirit and lacking love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those are just Christian jerks and we've met them. We don't like them. Sadly, sometimes it's been us, hadn't it? Not you guys, the people in the first service. But, but she said something that stuck with me, and I've been waiting months to talk to you about it, that the Pentecostal experience, right, the empowerment of the believer, when the Holy Spirit, uh, when we are saved, the Holy Spirit comes into us, but even Pentecost, a great confirming sign uh, that we're able to then pray in an unknown language, but then we live empowered by the Spirit, these gifts of the Spirit. To live Pentecostally means we actually can't just sit back and observe. We must lean in and participate. This is why some people will say, oh, you know, I was only able to watch online. It wasn't the same. They're, they're partially there, but even coming in the building and sitting there and just leaving at the end of the day, doing nothing falls short of who you were created to be. More than that, it's way more than coming on Sunday to do something for somebody else, but it should be involved. Living Pentecostally means we pray for each other on Monday, just like on Sunday. And wait till I tell you what can happen on a Thursday. Because a lot of people think being Pentecostal means we just yell something in a service on Sunday morning. But that is such a cheapening of the power that we've been given, the very spirit of God living in us, desiring for us to be a blessing to our neighbor, to our coworker, and we kind of signed up. We've actually obligated ourselves to others. Which is why Pentecostals especially, some of you are like, I don't even know what that is. We've talked about it a little bit, I'll keep trying throughout the day. We actually owe it to our neighbor to pray for them and them to pray for us. We cannot, by definition, be consumeristic at our core. 
Now, at some level, we have to say, what's a place, what's a church family that's got ministry in which my family can receive and all that? I get that. I'm not denying that reality, but there's a missing element if we stop at what can I receive and not what would God give me for them? So even as we talk about living Pentecostally, even as we talk about how do we keep on praying for all the Lord's people, you're like, well, pastor, you're preaching right now. We're not praying for each other, sure, because it's more than Sunday morning. So even as we talk about these gifts of the Spirit, even as we look at what this means, I want us to think beyond a Sunday morning service. To think beyond, like prayer gathering, we try to practice this every week. Go ask the Lord to give you a word of encouragement for somebody else, or if the Lord brings somebody to mind, pray for them. But you know, you can do that on Tuesday when you're praying all alone, and when the Lord puts somebody else on your heart, text them and say, I was just praying, and the Lord wanted me to encourage you. Why do you think the Lord brought them to your mind? We'll talk more about that, but, but Pentecostals, should, by definition, be participators. Not just consumers that say, oh, but God, so I wonder, what would your community group look like if the next time before you went to that house, you prayed before you got there? God, is there anything you wanna tell me? Anything you wanna show me that might encourage somebody that we're about to be at? What about the next time when we're just see somebody in the, in the grocery store and they're like, oh, my back is hurting. What if we don't say, well, come on Sunday, we got a prayer team. What if right there, we're like, this gift can be active for you. So 1 Corinthians 12 talks about these nine major gifts of the spirit. I'm gonna read those verses to us in case you didn't have it all memorized and read it in your devotions this morning. First Corinthians 14, two chapters later, really gives instructions of how to utilize those gifts in a corporate church setting. Because it's a tale as old as time that when you get groups of people together and too many people talking at once and you don't understand what's going on. So Paul was like, hey, let me help you guys out. You're a little crazy. So let me, but 1 Corinthians 13, what he's talking about in the middle, he explained some things. He talked how to do it. In the middle, he said, you gotta do it all with love. So it's also not new for believers to be consumed with their spiritual badges of gifts of the spirit and lack love in order to fall apart and confusion to reign within the body of Christ. Now the truth is, there's plenty of confusing things that we're already going through. I don't think we need to add another one, (laughs) but how many people know, if you've been the recipient of a gift of the Spirit, the Lord used somebody else to bring ministry to you, uh, any of these nine areas, you know it doesn't bring more confusion, it actually brings clarity to you. So one of my convictions in these confusing times is we actually need his help now more than ever. So, so we, we've got to resist this pressure from the enemy or, or magazine, I don't know what it was, church things, that, that says, oh, we can't, all those gifts of the spirit are weird. They're not weird. Some people are weird. But when we've received from God, none of us think it's weird. We just think it's awesome. What's weird is maybe if somebody doesn't explain what's going on or maybe they yell out in their King James voice, that's saith the Lord of hosts. <laughs> We're like, who is that? You know, God wants to tell you something. Okay, you know, I don't know, but right? We might bring, but, but I actually think that these gifts of the spirit are key for how we can keep on praying for all the Lord's people, for how we can live in these confusing times. So this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think some of these verses might be on the screen. Now about the gifts of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant. What was he saying? What he didn't say? Some of y'all are. That's okay. He's like, that's what I'm here for. That's what a spiritual leader does. He's like, I want to help you not be that way. So maybe you're here, you're like, I've never heard of gifts of the spirit. I don't know what Pentecostals all, that's okay. We're gonna talk about it. Welcome here to celebration. Verse four, he says, there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, 
but the same God at work. Do you notice this difference among us, but unity in him? Verse seven, now to each one. In other words, God's got a gift for everybody. Don't you dare think that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough. You are a creation of the king and he's got good things for you too. This doesn't say now to each one of the pastors. This says for everybody. This is for you if you're an everybody. If you're not sure your neighbor will help you. (laughs) Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit, here's the key, is given for the common good. I think we need more things that are good for everybody. You know, in this time where we're told it can only be good for half of the country, what if we presented the gifts of the Spirit? These are good for everybody. To one, there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, another message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, gifts of healing by one Spirit, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and then the interpretation of tongues. Those are those nine gifts. I'm gonna put them in some categories to help us track these a little bit, but they're all the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes to each one just as we want. Just as he determines. So right away, I want to remind us, let's not belittle the gifts that God has given to us, which are for other people. I'll get to that in a second and compare them, well, I wish I had what they had. You know, we're in October, we got the blessing tree coming up and Christmas. Let's not be those spiritual kids that complain about what our dad gave us. He knows exactly who we are. He knows exactly how we're wired because he made us that way. And let's lean in, let's be open and just be grateful for whatever it is that he gives to us to use for his glory, amen? All right, so here's the big idea. (coughs) Excuse me, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, simply this, the gifts are intended to complement or cooperate with each other and not compete with each other. Whether that's like, oh, well, I got the gift of healing and somebody else steps in front of them, well, I've got word of wisdom and somebody else, you're both losers. No, I don't know what it is, right? But... But it's also, we're not trying to yell our gift and put other people down or make sure ours gets, because they're not ours. You remember how many people came to the Holy Spirit Conference on Saturday night, Tim Enlow had talked about this extension cord. I'm still bitter that I'm 42 years old before I heard about it. I'm almost to get over it. I need one more session, then I'll be free. But (laughs) we plug into God to receive whatever it is he has from us. We don't pick, we receive And then we plug into others to give to them what he's given to us for them. Dr. Tennant talked a lot about this. We don't really have the gift. We probably shouldn't walk around saying, I have the gift of healing because we're giving it. And the person who has the gift is the one who received the healing. And we've gone on back on about our lives. Let me roll back, right? In our next steps class, Pastor Josiah teaches on this. And if you've been through it, you might've heard this. There's different gifts. And we think gifts of God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. Today, we're talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit, these nine major gifts. But you know, God, the father also gives us gifts. You can read in scripture, you know, uh, you could be gifted in accounting. In scripture, you could be gifted in carpentry. Right, so these are things um, that are gifts from God, but basically you get to operate in those at your own discretion. Right, how many people know you, if you're good at carpentry, you're good today and tomorrow, you don't really, you might practice, but you know, like that's just, you're there. Does that make sense? Right, then the gifts that Jesus gives are found in Ephesians, They're, they're the gifts to the church, right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they're gifts to the church for what? 
for the edifying, the building up, the equipping of the saints to do the works of ministry. Those are gifts that Jesus gives to his church. And then we have gifts of the spirit. It's not like an office or not how we operate. It's sure not just a skill set. We're good at Microsoft Excel. That might be a gift from God. But then when it comes to gifts of the spirit, they're not our gifts. We're a conduit of them. We don't heal anyone. We just pray for healing and the virtue, the power flows from him through us to them. And they receive the gift of no longer being lame. I mean, they might still be lame, but they can walk. You know what I'm saying? Like that's <laughs> got to clarify it's 2024, you know, but does that make sense? So these are not our gifts, like a badge of honor that we get to wear. Look at me. I have word of wisdom. All right, Joseph, quit telling everybody your dreams, but that's a whole separate, right? So these are just gifts that we get to participate in. I love what Tim talked about. I said, you know, these are like 10 bucks at Walmart. They're easily replaceable. So we shouldn't get too excited about ourselves. Now, at the same token, although they're 10 bucks at Walmart, easily replaceable, how many people know they're extremely vital to get from God to people? It's this weird tension that we live with. God wants to use us, but he might need to use somebody else. Easily replaceable. But it's a great joy that we have to plug into him and plug into others. But if we get it twisted, 10 bucks at Walmart, we're out. It's an interesting tension that we live with, right? I think it's also interesting in these days that we're living in, talking about how do you live Pentecostally? We've got to be involved in one another's lives. You know, this is not the longest extension cord at the church, but it was kind of the one I could hold without having, you know, the train of the robe filling the temple. Anyway, um, you got to have a little bit of proximity to God and to people to be used by him. This is, I think, something that many believers could, could improve upon. We've got to tie into him. You can't expect to be used by him in supernatural ways if you never spend time with him. You gotta plug into him. Sometimes, by the way, we're one extension cord. We might need to unplug from like mainstream media and to plug into him. We might need to unplug from whatever and plug into him because we just shouldn't be surprised if we're not plugged into him that there's no power flowing through us. And then by the same token, the point of the extension cord is not to get a fancy extension cord tire. I don't know what it is. Tie, zip tie. Plug into God and go, look at our zip tie. Some people are so removed from the people that need the power of God that they're not helping anybody. So yes, plug into him, but make sure, talk to your neighbor, talk to your coworker, ask God, who is it that you want me to simply make the connection for? So we have to live in in community, in some proximity with one another. And one of the things that would be my desire when it comes to these gifts is that we would demystify them. You don't need special music and lighting in order to be used by God. You don't have to yell out in a King James voice to give an encouraging word to somebody else. It might just be a text message. In other words, I I would love to see the body of Christ become more naturally supernatural. You know, you don't have to be a spooky, creepy Christian. If it's from God, it's from God and they'll know. And I can't think of many things that our world needs more than for believers to tap into the power of God and be an extension cord for others. So let's look at some of these gifts as our time is going. Number one, the discerning gifts. These are gonna be three categories uh, of gifts. This will include word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. These gifts, the discerning gifts, empower us to discern 
or perceive, other people might call it perceiving gifts, certain truths that can help somebody else. So that's really the goal of these discerning gifts. It's not uh, to just figure out what's going on in their life, it's to try to help them. And I think some people have avoided these gifts of the spirit because they've seen other people use them to manipulate people. But just because other people have done it incorrectly doesn't mean that they're not for us and for today. We ought to use these gifts not to chastise and critique others, but to bless them. The Bible says these gifts are given for the common good. Word of wisdom. There's some short summaries. Again, Tim and Lowe taught on this a little bit. Dr. Tennant's teaching, you can get online. Word of wisdom. Uh, this might be a divine answer or solution for a particular question or challenge. Sometimes the word of wisdom comes in knowing the right thing to say. And I think the word of wisdom sometimes can tell you the right thing to do. And you know, we live in confusing times. I think we need this gift to be active in the body of Christ. Let me give you a couple scriptural examples that I think help us see this in a tangible way. Because sometimes we just hear about these gifts and we're like, I don't know, is it somebody yelling something in a service? Let me give you a couple instances that weren't having anything to do with a church service so that you can see the everyday practicality of the gifts of the Spirit. John chapter nine, maybe you remember that text or maybe you'll remember the stories I share. There was a man who's healed of blindness. And the religious leaders were uh, interrogating everybody. Well, what's going on? What did he do? They were trying to figure out how could they trap Jesus, get him in trouble. They were interrogating him. They were talking to the parents. They were like, well, what's, what's going on? And I think a good example is that this poor beggar, this man that had lived blind, he, he probably didn't have a Bible college education. He probably wasn't as hard as the rabbis, but I think it might help us to look at this as though he might have had like a word of wisdom of just what to say in the moment. And he looked at him and said, one thing I know, once I was blind and now I see. End of discussion. <laughs> Sometimes God will give us a simple statement that will have profound impact. Another thing, it's not just knowing what to say, it might be knowing what to do. Matthew chapter 17, they were behind on the tax and Peter came to Jesus. He's like, what are we going to do? Jesus like, let's go fishing. Well, really, he said, Peter, you go fishing. Peter caught a fish and right in the mouth of that fish was the money to pay the temple tax. Now, I've heard a lot of fish tales, but that's a new one for me. Most of our fishing experiences, I, I, I don't go fishing. Most of y'all's fishing I'm not in North Carolina. Most of you guys is fishing. <laughs> Cost money. Got to buy a boat and get a rod and reel and line and bait. And this, that was wisdom that knew what to do. It's not just word of wisdom. There's word of knowledge. This might be when you know something specific that you couldn't know through natural means, meaning you didn't just stalk their Facebook page. Just because you look on their Facebook page doesn't give you a word of knowledge. We don't need to fake this stuff either. I'm so tired of phony baloney Christians trying to fake and manufacture gifts of the Spirit too. Supernatural transfer of information, a download that you couldn't know through natural processes. Here's another one, just an everyday conversation. I know Jesus is involved in some of these, but you know, hey, what are, what are we gonna do? John chapter four, the woman at the well. Bible said Jesus had to go through Samaria. He went there, he's talking to her, and she's like, well, I have no husband. Statement of fact. Jesus, it might be a word of knowledge, Feel like he operated in a whole lot of them because he was Jesus, but what did he say? Yeah, you got, you've had five and the one you're with ain't your husband either. Now some real judgmental goody two-shoes Christians probably been like, get her Jesus, use that word of knowledge to mess her stuff up. But that's not what the gifts of the spirit are to be used for. 
the way in which Jesus presented this information, she said, oh, tell me more. That ought to be people's reaction when we operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Tell me more. In fact, she went and told everybody else, hey, you got to meet this guy. So I actually believe our cities can be changed through the operation of gifts of the Spirit. There is an element of the supernatural that we as believers have left on the sideline and perhaps that's why some of our communities have not yet experienced revival or outpouring or awakening. I, I won't get into that, but. Also discerning of spirits. You know, sometimes we need help discerning whether a spiritual manifestation is godly or evil. Sometimes, like every day. <laughs> Again, if you've been around for a while, you're probably not as scared by this, but if you're newer, I'm not trying to scare you, but I am trying to make you aware there are demonic spirits present and active in our world today. We don't have to be afraid. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, but that is really going on. Those demonic forces seek to influence people's thoughts and behaviors and attitudes. But you know, not every struggle is demonic. Sometimes it's choices we made. I remember a couple months ago, I had a little stomach ache. I wasn't feeling too good. And Dana's like, well, what'd you have for dinner? I said, pizza. She said, oh, what'd you have for lunch? I said, more pizza. <laughs> As it turns out, the stomach ache was not uh, demonic. It was dominoes. You know what I'm saying? Like it was just, <laughs> so like demonic forces are real, but sometimes we just should have made a change, you know, so. But it happens, Acts chapter 16, let me give you another. Every day, I'm trying to give you everyday examples from scripture because again, I think a lot of times we hear gifts of the spirit and we just think church service. I don't know if you've noticed, all these examples so far were non-church service occurrences. And that's how I believe God wants to use us every day of our lives. Look at this, Acts chapter 16. Now my time is about gone, so I have to go really fast. But Apostle Paul, they, he was going to prayer. There was this demonic possessed girl. She was yelling out, oh, here he comes. And he was dazed, confused. It took him a minute. And then he was like, hey, that's a demonic spirit. He cast it out. But interesting to note, what she was saying was truth. But it was from a demonic force. You can't, discerning the spirits will help you not only discern what's true, but what's right. And, and Paul utilized this there in that moment. The girl had become a distraction to Paul's work in the area. And this gift, discerning the spirits, helped him be free. I'm praying that all of us would ask God to use that gift in our lives. Because so I think there's, some truthful statements, but coming from demonic forces in people's homes and businesses and in our communities. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to make us aware oh, of what that is. All right, the next grouping of gifts is the declarative gifts. It might be proclaiming gifts. If these other things were things that was a download of information to our mind. This is a declaration of things through our mouth. Some theologians might call these vocal gifts, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Prophecy is a message of encouragement from God through someone for other people, which by the way, is so much more than predicting the future. Although I guess that Still might happen sometimes. A lot more in the Old Testament. Once Jesus came and the gift of Holy Spirit was given to us, in the New Testament church, the gift of prophecy wasn't about who would win an election. I just wanted to make sure everybody got offended before I left. The gift of prophecy was, here, let me read it to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse three. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. In the New Testament church, the threefold role of prophecy is edifying, exhorting, and comforting. 
So I've found a great way to test the validity of a prophetic word these days is to ask who or what did it edify, exhort, or comfort? If it didn't do any of those three things and left everybody feeling icky, it might not have been prophetic, it might have been pathetic. Paul instructs us to pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, which doesn't mean we have to be weird and yell at people and interrupt them. And, but how can we encourage them with a word from the Lord? Scripture would not exhort us to desire the gift of prophecy if it wasn't gonna be available to us. You ever seen that meme is got this old guy with the fishing pole and somebody jumping up, oh, just missed it, just a little. That's not how God is with these things. He's not trying to put it just out of our reach and just when we get close and we're desiring and we're asking and we're seeking, he's like, oh, try harder. Oh, we get closer, work harder. Try work, give more. That's not what's going on. He wants to give us these things so that we can give them to others. Tongues, a message from God in a language unknown to the person that's giving the message. This is different than the confirming sign, the personal prayer language of tongues. Some people get a little confused in this. There's this baptism in the Holy Spirit where we have this personal prayer language. We pray in tongues, that's a personal setting. This gift of tongues is more of a corporate or group setting. This is a message for everybody in this unknown tongues. Now there's a lot in this that I don't know, uh, but I do know it's one of these gifts from God, the Holy Spirit for us. It's different than that speaking in tongues. First Corinthians 14, I don't have time today, but gives some instruction in these corporate gatherings and guidelines because the Corinthian church is a lot like the American church today. There was a lot of sexual immorality in the land. There was a lot of confusion in their gatherings. And Paul didn't say, knock it off, the gifts aren't for you. What he said is you got to do it in a way that doesn't bring confusion, but instead brings clarity and it confirms that God was in this place. So people have wrestled with this, what's going on and all that. So we're aiming for clarity, um, but we need to hear from God. This is what he said in verse 19. But in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words. You have to settle for four or three from your pastor, but to instruct others rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. It's not that messages in tongues are bad, but if it's not done correctly, people leave scratching their head wondering what took place. But as we see when we get to interpretation, uh, these things go together. But Paul's highlighting the importance of order so that it can benefit everybody in attendance, which is another reason for lack of clarity why I use a microphone every week. Pastor David, he doesn't need one, but we ask him to for the online. It helps it online, right? But so, so it just helps so that everybody can hear because we don't want me to talk to you guys and then you guys have no clue what's going on, which is why if it, any of these gifts and it's like a Sunday morning, a corporate setting and somebody's like, man, I feel like I have a word from the Lord. Come, you come let us know and we bring it up. We either read it, we have you share it, whatever that is, because we want to make sure everybody can get in on it because the gifts of the spirit are for the common good, not just a couple people good. And if we just don't have a little bit of order, if we're lacking that order, it might feel good for the person to be used or a couple people that are around, but we want everybody in on what God is saying. Otherwise, why do we gather? It's not just for a couple people, there's something for everybody. So we're striving for that clarity so that people aren't confused. And so we want God to speak, we just want everybody to be able to hear. Interpretation of tongues, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is understanding, expressing the thought or intent of that message in tongues. The larger the group, the more structure is needed. When it's two or three of you, it's very easy to tell who's talking. You ever been in a group of three, you know, you're in person, you all know who's gonna talk. You ever done a Zoom with 45 people? Nobody knows whose turn it is to talk and everybody's talking over each other and we wouldn't want any gathering like that. So the smaller your gathering, the easier it is for everybody to participate. The larger the group, the, the more it's like a few people do and everybody else listens. But that's why we don't limit these things to just one hour a week. We're saying, what can we do all the time? So this interpretation of tongues. Uh, our deaf ministries helped me so much with this. Carol Schultz, you know, had been leading and... ASL, American Sign Language, is not a literal translation word for word of the English language. It's an interpretation. So sometimes they reverse 
the concepts. This will happen when I travel around the world sometimes, right? The subject matter and verb or whatever will get confused in the English sentence. And so you kind of got to give a couple sentences so that then it can be translated in a way that can, people can understand. Sometimes I'll say a lot in a sermon and then the translator says like, Dios le bendiga. I'm like, I talked for 20 minutes and all you said is Dios le bendiga. God loves you. Okay, but it's not a word for word. So we don't need to judge how long was a message in tongues by time and then how long is the interpretation. You know, I don't know in your house, but like in our house, we could watch one movie and I could give a very short description of it and feel like I explained the whole thing. And maybe one of our kids or my wife might want to say a few more things about it, how they felt about it, what they were wearing, when they watched it. I don't care. It's done. I'm ready to watch the next thing. But we don't need to evaluate that time and go, hmm, I feel like they should have said a little bit more. No, we just want to hear from God and that interpretation helps bring clarity to us. So if that message is loud enough for more people to hear and it's kind of that public setting, then we would want to pause and say, okay, what, what's that interpretation? Otherwise, maybe somebody got excited and it was really supposed to be a personal moment and not a corporate moment. And then we would make mention of that because we wouldn't want people confused. It's not to critique somebody, but to just bring clarity to what's taking place. And then here's the third and final thing is, uh, I don't know why I felt like I could do three points with three sub points, but anyway, the dynamic gifts. Some people might call this, if you're trying to do P words, the power gifts, but I was going with dynamic because power sounds like we have the power and we just plug into the power, but dynamic. This is faith, healings, and working of miracles. These three distinct gifts can oftentimes produce similar results. And I think they're the most readily accepted in and out of the body of Christ. Faith, the supernatural impartation of confidence for a specific situation. This is different than general faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. We're saved by grace through faith. But this faith is like a special, strong, in the moment faith. Maybe you've met people like that and it just felt like they could believe for something. It's like a Vikings fan after we lose twice in five days, still believing. This is our you. That's special faith. That's what this gift is. As soon as you're a Lions fan, leave us alone. Most of the time we get to pick on you, but this is not our year to pick on you. Okay, so, but faith, we need people around us uh, to be with that. Immediate obedience is often the result of the gift of faith. Sometimes we're just like, we're not sure if we could. And then all of a sudden, when we just feel that faith well up inside of us, I think that's a gift from God that in that moment we can push forward, we can do and I'm, I'm praying for an increase of faith in our land. Some people say, political f party, what, what do I identify with? I'm a possibilitarian. <laughs> That's not a thing, but I wish it was. Okay, gifts of healings, because it's plural. So I think it's different types of healing, physical, emotional, spiritual, anything that's wrong. Supernatural gifts of divine health. As we mentioned, we're not the healer, we're just that conduit. And by the way, as followers of Jesus, we should all rebuke sickness and pray for anyone in need. Amen. Right? The power of God is just the same at aisle nine at the grocery store as it is at the front here at the church. When we encounter a need on Thursday, we shouldn't say, well, wait till Sunday. Hopefully the prayer team's there. There might be some special faith there, but we can all participate in what's going on. Acts chapter nine. Bible says this, there he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. We're not the healer, Jesus is. We plug into him, we connect with others. He said, rise and make your bed. And immediately he got up. I'm praying for great demonstrations of the kingdom when it comes to gifts of healings in these days. I was so encouraged as I was hearing testimony this morning from people, whether it's been on Sunday or Wednesday, as groups have gotten together to pray, just in groups of three or four and, and praying and, and healings have taken place where they were driving home and they began to feel things change. And by the time they got out of their car, they could tell the pain was gone that they had, had suffered with, that they got up the next day and two weeks later, still pain-free. I'm praying for a great demonstration of the power of God through gifts of healing for the proclamation of his saving grace. 
And then lastly is the working of miracles. And I know we need to pray. The working of miracles, this is divine intervention that changes our natural circumstances. I still believe God does miracles. It's not just healings. It's all kind of miracles. I'm sure Dr. Tennant could give us a much better explanation of this, but for me, I liked it being ninth on my list. To me, it was like, if you didn't get what you needed from God and any of the others, he's still got this one for you. Working of miracles. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you need God's power to turn your life around a negative situation, he's a worker of miracles. If you need a way to be made out of no way, he's the worker of miracles. If you need provision, if you need water from a rock, he's the worker of miracles. And I pray we bring him everywhere we go. That we plug into him and show up at our job. That we plug into him, we show up at our kids' sports team. We plug into him and we show up in our classroom. We plug into him and we pull back in our home after a long day at work and we give our family what we've received from God. I pray the body of Christ would live Pentecostally, active with the gifts of the Spirit every day of our lives, not just attending church, wondering if anybody will yell anything out. So I know we need to dismiss. Our time is gone and... I want to pray this way as we did last week and just trying to add things to our prayer. Talk to somebody who said, I never heard of palms down, palms up. And just in that moment felt such a weight come off. And I'm just going to pause for a moment and we don't have time to get in the groups. Pastor Josiah is going to come and dismiss us, but I just want to pause for like 30 seconds, not even very long. I know we need to go and you have places to be, but I just want to pause for 30 seconds and have everybody pray. Holy Spirit, would you Use me in some way this week. As I plug into you, would you show me who I should plug into? That encouraging word, that gift of healing, that working of miracles. So let's just pray. Let's just quiet our hearts in these next 30 seconds. Number one, asking God to use us. And number two, maybe he'd begin to show us a face or give us a name of who he wants us to share his good news with this week. Those gifts of the spirit today. So in this moment of pause, this brief, holy pause today, oh God, we say we're open to hear from you and we're desiring to be used by you. I pray for divine appointments this week for your people who will plug into you and plug into those in need. Use us this week for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you learned something from this message and are able to apply it to your life. If you gave your life to Jesus for the first time or the 10th time, reach out to us on Facebook or email us at info at celebrationchurch.net. Thank you for listening and we'll see you again next week.